And I've done lots of expeditions. I've only done two the old way. One was Mawson and now I was embarking on the Shackleton yeah. expedition. Now, Sir Ernest Shackleton is how I became aware of you in the first place. I had read yes. Endurance. Yes. Um, I had actually talked about it on the Lancing. podcast. Yeah. Wonderful podcast book. before. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it's just an amazing book. And more importantly, just an amazing story. Yes. And I became enamored with Shackleton both as like a man and as a leader. And I guess for me personally, I'm twenty six. I sometimes have a hard time like sort of uh, grasping what masculinity means and like I sometimes like wrestle with what those terms are and like how to really uh, situate myself like as a leader and who can I look to and Shackleton became one of those people for me I really admired him so much and I just thought he was an amazing person amazing um, yeah and I'm curious would you mind just breaking down sort of like his original journey and what his original voyage was supposed to be and what ended up occurring yeah well you know Shackleton was around in the heroic era just like Morse and, and Scott and Amundsen, the, the Norwegian, and in fact, Peary from the States. They were all these heroic era explorers. And actually, uh, Shackleton did did four expeditions. His first one, he was with Scott on, on an expedition to Antarctica. Is that the it? Nimrod? Um, Nimrod was was Shackleton's second expedition. Ah, it's his, he, the first one that he led, but the second expedition that he'd been on after. He was on Discovery with Scott. Nimrod was his first one, where he tried to get to the South Pole on foot. Turn with, round. Yeah. With Mawson, I think. Mawson yeah, was so the Mawson was there too, interestingly. But Mawson was on another... Often these expeditions had teams that did different things. Mm-hmm. So Mawson went off again to try... With this fascination with the magnetic pole, off he went on a journey to try and get to that. In fact, he did do it. And Shackleton, meanwhile, went for the geographic South Pole, which is the big one. Right. And he famously turned around 97 miles from his goal, his life goal, and uh, when he got home, he said to his wife, I, th- I-, I thought you'd rather a, a, a live donkey than a dead lion. And, um, <laughs> but he saved everyone in, in, in the course of doing that. Whereas right. a lesser person might have just plowed on yep. and sacrificed the team f- in pursuit of his ego, really, which he didn't, which right. is amazing. Yeah. Um, he then went down again. So after that, um, Scott and Amundsen reached the South Pole. Scott, of course, died with everyone. Amundsen made it, and that goal had been achieved. So Shackleton went on his famous expedition, which was to try and cross the whole of the continent, one side to the other, right. via the South Pole. And everything went wrong on that trip. And the survival journey that that emerged out of the kind of ashes of that expedition were really a, a far bigger story than the original goal of crossing Antarctica would have been. Yeah. So I guess in short, and correct me if I'm wrong in any of the details, him and a crew of 52, 53 men? It, it, was, 20, it was 27 plus him. So it was 28 men uh, on that it. trip. On so that trip. 27 men, they leave Buenos Aires, they go to Antarctica, they have this wooden ship called the Endurance, they get stuck in an ice sheet, and then now they're stranded on an ice sheet for basically like six months, eight months, something like that. Yeah, they get stuck in the ice. Um, the ice closes in around the hull of the ship, crushes it. Yep. And in the end, the only thing holding it up is the fact the ice is packed around it tightly. As soon as the wind changes direction, ice goes apart, down goes ship. And yep. they've been stuck for 10 months on the ship. Right. They then live for another five months on the same ice that had claimed the ship. Which is just in, insane. In, in just a series of really precarious camps. One was called Ocean Camp, one was called Patience Camp. And, you know, things were looking pretty bleak. And this ice flow is basically breaking in half every couple of days. It's, and no they're problem. they're on it and it's like a mile long. And then it breaks in half and now it's half a mile. Oh, yeah. And, and then it it's became, a quarter it, of a mile. It became smaller and smaller and smaller. In the end, it was about the size of a tennis court. And they were just on this thing, 27 of them, under three of the upturned lifeboats from the ship, which are these 22-foot keelless rowboats, basically. Yep. Killer whales in the water, uh, winter approaching, not enough food. Uh, you know what comes next you know yeah just um, floating in the ocean basically aimlessly. yeah and and he'd been meanwhile Shackleton has got them playing soccer and <laughs> and and you know doing lectures and all the kind of stuff you don't do if you think you're going to die so he, he, he was clever because it made people feel that he had the measure of these conditions and that somehow he was going to get them out of it you know because yeah. he wasn't panicking right which is amazing yeah it's incredible leadership and then they basically float on this ice until they get close to a little island and well, not even close really five days out from a little island that's right and then they all jump on some boats yeah and they row through a storm in the antarctic like the most insane shit ever and they yeah, land yeah. on this little island i, I mean you know it, it, look it, even though i've done what i've done i still marvel at that trip because i mean 
you know, their, their hand was forced. The ice broke up underneath them one night, and so they put the boats in the water, like you said, five days. But, I mean, these are keelless rowboats with yeah. no deck, with mountainous seas. The temperature is, is freezing. The water is freezing, literally freezing. Yeah. Uh, the only reason it's still liquid is because it's kind of saline. Yeah. Otherwise, it'd be just totally solid. And you know they get they're hypothermic. They you know they 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 just don't have enough food. They have no rest. Um, you know they're one guy's bailing constantly with a bucket to stop the whole thing just going under. They, you know they, they can't feel their hands. There's it's one just, moment in the book that's so fascinating where they say they would rather be in the water because at this point the rowboats are full of water. Yeah. And they would rather be in the water because the water is warmer than the air. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. an insane concept to even imagine. Yeah, you know, it, it, look, it, look, I know what it's like and, and it, it is, it is, you know, it's just brutal really. I mean, to, to, yeah. to make that decision. So you know. they, they make it basically and it, they've been now on ice for, they haven't been on solid ground for over a year. Yeah, and they finally 22 made, months actually been 20. But if you include the journey down from the UK and, you know, it's insane. It's 22 months. And yeah. I'm reading the book and they finally make it to land and I go, oh, thank goodness, it's over. Yeah. And that's kind of where the story starts. That's right. In a way. That's and, right. And this is where your story starts also. That's right. I so mean, what happens for them and, and what do you recreate? So they get to this island called Elephant Island, named after elephant seals that live there, not not the real type, obviously. And, <laughs> and it's just on the way to nowhere. It's just the remote jagged fang of rock sticking out of the southern ocean no human population to this day it's just too remote too on his inhospitable and you know they all celebrate you know they've saved themselves as far as they're concerned shackleton knows better he thinks we're not going to survive the winter it's coming fast uh only thing for it is to try and affect some sort of rescue mission trouble is nearest place is 900 miles away 800 nautical miles away across the roughest ocean in the world the only vessel they've got is a kind of rowboat basically yeah uh, so he takes the five strongest men uh puts planks on the most seaworthy of the three rowboats taking them off the other two boats and leaves 22 of the guys behind on elephant island and gets together with the five strongest and off he goes across the southern ocean on this perilous rescue mission insane and basically the insane, stakes yeah. are he has all of his men on elephant island yeah and he's going on a rowboat with five other guys yeah and they're they're going out into this uncharted ocean trying to hit a tiny little island of whalers and if they miss the island in either direction they're dead that's about right and, and all the men that he brought with him that he was supposed to care for are also dead absolutely yeah that's right he doesn't get through everybody dies basically right um and and you know even if he misses south georgia which is the name of the island he's trying to get to boat with no keel which is the kind of vertical thing sticking out of the bottom of the boat on modern yachts you don't just turn around and have another go. You see it going past in the rear view mirror. You can't turn around and sail back because the winds and currents are pushing you kind of north. Wow. And you can't you can't tack upwind in, in, in a boat with no keel, right? Oh, you I just, didn't realize You that. can point that way and try and you're not climb going out of the lobster pot, but in reality, you're just going to get pushed backwards. Oh, that's crazy. So he had to get there and he had to land where he could. If he'd missed it, the next land is Namibia in Africa, about 4,000 Three and a half, four thousand miles further on. He only so brought rations for four weeks anyway. He, he, you know they're already they're already in terrible shape. Right. He lands, but he lands on the wrong side. You know, he lands on the southern side of the island, and the whaling stations they're on the northern side, and in between is a mountain range, and no one's ever climbed it. Yeah. And he has no climbing equipment. He has no climbing kind of background. Uh, he's got one little length of rope. He's made some crampons, you know, the spikes on the bottom of the boots, taking nails out of the packing cases from the boat, you know, the ship's stores. Yeah. Um, and, you know, off they go into the mountains of South Georgia, which is technical mountaineering with nothing, basically. No tent. Yeah. So they can't stop. Mm -hmm. If you stop, you die. Yeah, it's remarkable. And he crosses in the time that even Reinhold Messner, the world's greatest modern mountaineer, has been unable to replicate wearing plastic boots, Gore-Tex jackets, sat phones, GPS, you know, Mars bars probably, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, and incredible. What, what's remarkable about that leg of the journey, I guess two legs, right? That's what you did. You yes. recreated that. Yeah. So we rebuilt the boat. Uh, I spent years researching, rebuilt the boat, learned to traditionally navigate. So, you know, using a sextant to get an angle to the sun. Yeah. So talk, use, to, me, talk to me about the sextant. This is yeah. so remarkable to me because I'm thinking yeah. like, okay, I'm here on Elephant Island. I got to get to Southern Georgia. Yeah. I could, I'll have my GPS, I'll, I'll look at the stars, like I know where I'm going, as long as I'm going yeah. the right way. Yeah. That's not really true. 
No, that's true. I mean, look, a sextant is one of those one of those devices where you look through it and you, it gives you an angle and you set it and you take an angle to any celestial object, the moon, sun, stars. Um, the difficulty of Southern Ocean is you just don't see them. You know, it's right. foggy, it's, it's claggy, you can't see anything. And you've got to see, if you're going to use the sun, you've got to see the sun when it's at the high point in the sky mm. where you are. There's no point seeing it when it's low on the horizon. It's got to be at that high point. So on the occasion you see it, you've got to kind of look at it, take a bearing, write down the numbers, do the calculations, and then look at it again a couple of minutes later. If it's climbed higher, you've got to then get, disregard the last reading and, uh, and you keep going until it starts to dip and then you take that one and you run the numbers and then you work out your latitude. So where you are on the planet, on the horizontal lines, north-south, mm. you know, doesn't tell you where you are east-west. That's guesswork, right? That's just, you've got to kind of get, that's dead reckoning. Yeah. And, you know, he has two storms, a hurricane. He's got seas which are 75 feet from peak of one wave to trough of the next. You know, it's, it's, it's brutal stuff. Boats threatening to capsize the whole time. And, you know, he makes it. He makes it. Yeah, it's remarkable. Crosses the mountains, raises the alarm, saves all the men. You know, it's just... Uh, Edmund Hillary said it's the greatest survival journey of all time. Yeah, yeah, it might be. Now, you were crazy enough to recreate it. So talk to me. What was the challenge like while you're, you know, leaving Elephant Island, basically, in your own tiny little topless rowboat? Yeah. What happens to you, you know, in the first week? What's, what's happening psychologically? So, you know, we built a ba basic deck like he did, but, you know, it leaks a lot. And, um, and you know, we did this voluntarily, right? So... Um, you get in the boat, you push off, you're not sure it's the right thing, but you do it anyway. And and once you're, something then switches. As soon as you're 200 yards offshore, you're on Shackleton's journey. There's no going back. So right. all you've got to do is kind of steal your resolve to just make the first step, and then the rest is kind of the same journey as his, and, yeah. and you've got no choice. And, uh, you know, I never forget pushing off, and we were not even a day in, and a massive iceberg appears in front of us. And I thought, how the hell are we going to get around that? And I tried to sail downwind of it, because a little toy mast you got with a little sail. And uh, one of the guys on board who was a very, very good sailor, the captain, the captain, because I was the leader of the expedition, Nick, good friend of mine, skipper. And he said, Christ, don't go, don't ever do that again. Don't go downwind, because if you, it's like it's like a a city block with apartment buildings on it. If you go downwind of it, they block out the wind. The iceberg blocks out the wind and you're Stuck. just sitting dead in the water and then the iceberg runs you over. So don't do that. You've got to stay up. So you know, you're learning all the time. Oh, that's crazy. Learning all the time. So you're getting dumped on with, with all the time. water and rain for, uh, what, two weeks basically? Yeah, two weeks. Two weeks of big sea state. Uh, we had a couple of calm days. The rest were not, you know, and so you've got waves crashing in. You're standing in kind of knee-deep. Uh, you know, essentially freezing seawater. Can't feel your toes. You can't feel your hands. Your clothing is totally wet. You're borderline hypothermic. You do an hour on the helm of the boat, then you bang on the hatch. Next guy comes up, you go down, and you spend the next five hours trying to dry your clothes with your body heat, and then you repeat. You know, that's the way it works. Um, and you're in a seated position, sitting on top of rocks, mm -hmm. which Shackleton used for ballast to stop the boat tipping over. We took the same weight of camera batteries because we made a film for Discovery Channel, right? And then we took a few extra rocks just to make up the make up the weight. And you know, it's it's a brutal, uh, scary, unpleasant, um, harsh <laughs> environment. Not for everyone. How know? did you pick the crew? So that was a process of a few years, you know, and basically I look for people who <clears throat> who are sort of selfless, they're prepared to work for one another, they've obviously got to have top skills. So, you know, we had, you know, fantastic round-the-world sailor, uh, another sailor with seven world records in sailing. My climbing partner, Baz, is former regimental sergeant major for the Royal Marines, which is an elite regiment. He's a fantastic mountaineer. Another guy who's a great boat builder and another guy who'd summoned, summoned Everest three times and is the UK's former free diving champion, so single breath diving as deep as you can. He wow. was the camera, cam the guy who kept the cameras going on board the boat. Pretty qualified crew. Really like. qualified crew. I probably wouldn't have um, made it. <laughs> you never know. Maybe. You know, it depends. <laughs> Let's see what skills you got. Yeah. And, and um, you know, 
people say, look, is that cheating a bit? Because, you know, they were, you know, is it is it unfair to stack the deck in your favour with some really good people? And I said, well, who do you reckon the original guys were? They were no kind of Muppets. They were the best of the time. Of the best, best of the best, you know. Right. So um, we were just trying to, to, to live up to, you know, the very high bar that these guys had set 